But Mr. Halliday is the guy you should salute when you go and visit your public library, if you go and visit any public library in California, because it was his dream to make that happen. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to try, try not to get too worked up over, <laughs> over him. <laughs> Um, anyway, the largest reading room that I could find prior to 1854 was Mr. Schleden's General Library. He claimed to have 18,000 volumes. That's way more than the Mercantile Association, the other, another library, way more than we would have for years. Mr. Schleden, though, had trouble getting people to pay. And if you look over the year, over the months of his uh, library, the membership cost goes down and down and down. And finally, he says, 18,000 books for sale. <laughs> <laughs> the clamor for a public library in San Francisco s started, as far as I know, in May of 1851, when the principal newspaper at the time, the Daily Alta, begged for one for when the bar room, the billiard table, the gambling saloon, the masquerade, and the retreats of Cyprian wantonness get tiresome. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? What do you think Cyprian wantonness is? <laughs> well, it's, Cyprus is close to Greece. Anyway, my mind's spinning off into uh, places it shouldn't go. Anyway, what the city needed, the newspaper claimed, was a place where congenial spirits could meet and enjoy the luxury of rational conversations, where they could exchange thoughts and ideas and read and reflect. Then, in November of 1851, something momentous happened. The Mechanics Exchange opened on Montgomery Street at Washington. Now this is a picture of one that opened in Sacramento. I could not find a picture of one of ours here in, in uh, San Francisco, but the concept was the same. And what the Mechanics Exchange was, was an enterprise that aimed to provide facilities for contractors and mechanics to find employment, draw up contracts, meet staff, potential staff, interview them, receive mail, and transact business. I imagine it as kind of a career center slash kinkos slash coffee house. It is at this place that the working people of the city first congregated and where they could get together outside of the saloons and private clubs and other dangerous places to talk about wages and laws that affected their lives. Like the city and state's license taxes. These laws were an attempt to generate a stable source of income. Keep in mind, at this time, the economy as a whole, city and state, was dependent upon the production and export of gold, which fluctuated wildly and also appeared to be drying up. The city and state charged a separate quarterly tax, which affected virtually all people engaged in the trade, sale, manufacture, or disposal of goods. A pawnbroker, for example, would pay the city quarterly nearly $7,000 in today's money. This was in addition to the state's license tax, which was 10 cents per $100 of business estimated. And that actually is in 1852 um, dollars, $51, so $7,000 is in today's money. A anyway, I'll stop talking. In January of 1852, fu furor over these license laws was boiling over. The mechanics of the city met three times at the mechanics exchange to plan their response, and ultimately they resolved to challenge the constitutionality of the state and city license laws, uh, and they would take their fight to the California Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the mechanics as a whole, statewide, are beginning to recognize that they as a group were a formidable force for change. In Sacramento, the mechanics struck on August 1st and resolved not to work less than $6 a day. They chose that number because they felt 
That was the going rate for mechanics in San Francisco, and Sacramento hated the fact that they weren't getting paid as much as, as uh, mechanics here. A few days later, the blacksmiths and journeyman house painters met in San Francisco to do the same. And less than a week later, on August 14th, the carpenters, carpenters and joiners in Marysville met at 7 a.m. in the main plaza, formed themselves into a line, and headed by a drum and fife, marched through the principal streets of the town, demanding higher wages. The whole time, the newspapers abounded with stories of mechanics institutes around the world and how they helped their communities prevail. The mechanics of this city began to see a need for such an organization, one that catered to their social and political needs, their reading interests, and their professional growth. On the evening of December 11th, 1854, the ringleaders of all these former uh, actions that I've talked about, the meetings to fight the special license taxes, the meetings to raise wages, those guys were John Syme, Roderick Matheson, Benjamin Haywood, George Gluyas, and two scores of others. They met in the tax collector's office where Roderick Matheson worked <laughs> at City Hall with the objective of forming a mechanics institute. So here's a list of the more leading members of, of us. Um, the fellows in red I said were the ringleaders. Benjamin Haywood, 25 years old in 1854. He was an active organizer of the mechanics and represented them to the state or at the state legislature and at large civic events like the funeral of Henry Clay, who was a Whig. And when he died, uh, there was mass demonstrations all over the nation and a big one here in San Francisco. George Karkik Gluyas, he was a member of the city government. He was on the board of aldermen, sort of a proto board of supervisors. And John Syme, he was a, also active in the Whig party. He was a California assemblyman and a major advocate for mechanics uh, uh, interests. He introduced a mechanics lien law and other fun things. The only person I have a picture for is Roderick Matheson, handsome devil. Uh, we know the most about him because he wrote a lot of letters to his wife and he left the city in 1856 because of strife caused by the death of James King of William. Anyway, he was active in the Whig Party, he worked in the tax collector's office, and was a clerk, uh, and then later our president. And then he left, where he moved to Healdsburg and founded another mechanics and agricultural institute. Then he went to fight in the Civil War and died. Anyway, our founders all had boundless faith in the future of San Francisco as a port and an industrial center. They had great concern about the moral atmosphere of San Francisco. Keep in mind, it was, the city was 90% men under the age of 40. They probably, in particular, were concerned about that Cyprian wantonness. <laughs> uh, and most importantly, they had an aversion to imported goods, which they believed kept prices high and kept uh, local people from getting jobs. What I'm struck with is how contemporary these concerns are. Sounds just like today. So from the start, the directors knew what they wanted. They wanted a library with open stacks, so all the books were accessible to the members. They wanted a game room where members could relax and spread out their chess and checkerboards. They wanted classes that would stretch the mind and teach useful skills. The city still needed to be built. We needed people that knew what they were doing. <laughs> uh, and they wanted to be an organization that welcomed everyone, regardless of race or gender, and to cost as little as possible. Oops, let's go back. So, do you think this is what they had in mind? <laughs> All righty, <laughs> the problem was getting the funds together. Lots of private libraries would start, 
and fold because they had no um, way to make money. So following meetings outlined a plan for raising money. Stock was to be offered at $25 a share. Everyone had to buy one uh, share of stock. Uh, and $25 back then was about $700 in today's money. So in addition, you had to pay, well, only 10% was due though at first, which would later be a problem. You had to sign the Constitution, which meant that you believed in the Mechanics Institute and you would do everything you could to make it successful. And then individual memberships were uh, five, there was a $5 initiation fee, which was roughly $140 in today's money. And then there were quarterly dues of $1.50. So basically what it appears to me is that our $95 membership fee is an incredible deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then in subsequent meetings, the constitution and bylaws were written and a logo was designed by architect Thomas Boyd. I am stunned by this picture. And let me tell you why you should be too. The symbols are very common to mechanics institutes in general, especially that arm and hammer at the top. That's a symbol of the strength of labor. The, uh, the beehive at the bottom, right there. The beehive connotes industry. And then everything else on the shield there are symbols of the mechanic the architect, we've got a plumb line, a leveler, a compass, all symbols of the craftsman. The cornucopias flanking that represent California's agricultural bounty, and the anchor to the left, its role as a port. The scales remind us to lead a balanced life. And the motto, be just and fear not, that's a quote from Shakespeare's Henry VIII. It admonishes one to lead one's life according to your principles.